Howdy, howdy, Sue Devil here, and welcome to my review of the Warhammer 2 patch notes for the Resurgent updates. I am just fresh back from vacation, and I will do my best to get these out. It's storming like crazy here, so if you hear thunder in the background, that's because it is absolutely insane outside right now. So hopefully I can get this all recorded and uploaded without the power going out and and my computer getting fried. We'll, we'll see how this all works. Anyways, uh, the patch notes are lengthy and as always I'm going to go through every single note and uh, do my best to relay what this patch note has. So I will add commentary where I have some thoughts but otherwise I really I'm just going to go through it. So this resurgent update is along with the Queen and the Crone uh, DLC which is fantastic and it looks very lengthy and uh, pretty um, comprehensive which is fantastic so anyways we'll just start going through it and I will go through every bit of it if you want to see every bit of it this video is for you if not there's a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of summary videos out there and of course I'll spend a little extra time on the Dowie when I get there so this update arrives alongside the Queen and the Crone Lords pack, bringing a huge array of content additions, revisions, and improvements to the Total War Warhammer 2 and the Mortal Empires campaign, as well as many bug fixes and balance changes, which is fantastic. The Resurgent update brings full implementation of the Norska race pack to the Mortal Empires. Yes. All right. Uh, this includes all the content from the original Norska race pack for Total War Warhammer, alongside new monster hunt quests and technologies to more fully integrate the race into the Mortal Empires campaign setting. Ownership of the Norska race pack is required to play Norska in Mortal Empires, of course. This also brings the 30th anniversary regiments of renown from Total War Warhammer, bolstering the forces of the Beastmen, Norska, Bretonia, Warriors of Chaos, and what else with 30 unique elite unit variants in the Mortal Empires campaign. And finally, a host of extras have been added to switch up Warhammer 2 and Mortal Empires, which includes all elven races now gain the Shrine of Cain campaign mechanic, so that is the Sword of Cain, a powerful blade of legend, is buried beneath the Shrine of Cain. The first elven race to build the shrine to the Widowmaker building at the Shrine of Cain will gain the blade, which may be equipped to any general. Uh, the Sword of Cain hugely magnifies the general's combat prowess, but there's a cost in the campaign game for wielding the blade, which uh, seems to be uh, public order and these kind of things, but it's, it looks like it's pretty awesome. <clears throat> any faction who defeats the wielder may claim the Sword of Cain, thus only elven races may unearth it, but all races may sub subsequently claim and wield the sword, which is super cool. Which means we have a good chance of getting that if we want to do another Paint the Map campaign. High Elves have gained two new technologies from the Shadowlands and the Strength of Avalorn. Ungram Iron Fist now begins the Mortal Emperor campaign in Karak Kadrin and gains the ability Red Rune, which is completely awesome and I can't wait to play that campaign. Dwarfs now gain the Giant Slayer unit, which is awesome. Dwarf Forging. This is, I just, I cannot wait to start forging and crafting my own items. The forge looks fantastic. And when I go through my campaign, I am going to be sure to make heavy use of the Dwarf Forge. But we may, Dwarf Faction may now craft unique magic items. They're not magic, they're rune imbued, but whatever. That's okay, CA is not Dwarfs. Uh, I represent the dwarfs, so maybe they don't understand. It's not magic; it's rune, runes. But whatever. Uh, and new, a new resource called Oath Gold, which is absolutely awesome. Thorgrim Grudgebearer gains the new ability Oath of Vengeance. There's ten new landmark buildings that have been added to a variety of races, and the landmark buildings are awesome. When I went through my Mortal Empires campaign, we did paint the map and we found every unique building. And they're all fun, they're all interesting, and 10 more of them just is going to make the games and campaigns that much better. A new achievement for completing the Mortal Empires and Old World Race as an Old World Race has been added. Cool. The Skaven Laboratory mode now gets a hardware benchmarking feature. That's very cool. I'll be able to benchmark my computer. Sartosa has been added to the Mortal Empires campaign. Cool. Negareth, Negareth has been moved to Negaroth, which whatever, it's elf stuff. So Norska additions. So they have a lot of new monster hunts. So the Gargantulazan, the Hell Beast of Seepgor, Beast of Rama, Mother of the Flame. They have new techs, which is also fantastic. And actually, all this stuff I looked at some of the regiments of renown that are out there. Multiplayer is going to be absolutely fantastic. It's going to be a whole new game, which is one of the strengths of the Total War series. I think is that the multiplayer scene is just going to continue to get more interesting. I, I have made a video asking 
for suggesting some ways to improve multiplayer. I wish CA would really put the full force of a group, a small group within the group to focus on enhancing multiplayer and opening it up to more people, but it is what it is. So Norsk Attack, Scavengers of the New World, Devastation of the Dark Elves, Butchering of the High Elves, <laughs> that's a good one, Pillaging of the Lizardmen, Annihilation of the Skaven, Plundering of the Tomb Kings. All right, nothing for the dwarfs, which is good. Uh, they have new tech, Secrets of Dark Sorcery, Secrets of the Court, Secret of the Ancients, Secrets of the Under Empire, and Secrets of Past Dynasties, and they have new Confederation Dilemmas. So the Dwarf Editions, these are the ones that I'm most interesting, interested in. So they moved Ungram to Karak Kadrin, where it's where he belongs. I can't wait to play that campaign. It's going to be so fun, and I'm going to play a blind campaign, so I'm not going to go through and do the campaign a few times and try and uh, work it out make sure I present a, a very clean campaign. I'm going to do it blind and do my best to work my way through it so that anyone who wants to watch will be able to watch with me and uh, or work their way through it with me and see how good we can do. Uh, they added the Giant Slayers, which look fantastic. I can't wait to test them. And the Dwarf Forge, so the ability for Thorgrim, Oath of Vengeance, the ability for Ungram, Red Ruin, and it's a very powerful. I think it's like a 60% boost to weapon strength. And they have new abilities for Belagar, which is fantastic. Gather the old clans, rally the holds, and an Oaths of Reclamation, which is really interesting. We'll see how Belagar kits out in multiplayer. Uh, he's already really strong. Like He's actually a very good lord in multiplayer and in campaign. He's just sort of overlooked because all the lords are good, but he's quite good so we'll see where he comes out and they have a new skill for rune lords and rune smiths which are master of the forge i can't wait to see that so general additions uh new high elf tech from the shadowlands and strength of avalorn 30th anniversary regions of renown have been added to relevant races 10 landmark buildings new achievement okay new benchmark for laboratory so bug fixes fixes and improvements so the overall lighting balance pass across all battle map environments which is great there were some some battle maps that just the shadows looked really weird and you know but i mean the game looks beautiful all around and this will just make it look even better it really is a pretty game to look at so improved ssao to reduce over occlusion which i don't know what that means but i'm sure somebody out there does improve shadows for better frame to frame stability AI will no longer dodge every artillery projectile. This is actually really good. And, you know, especially in campaign, because you could really, you know, just send your Lord out and, and uh, they would try and dodge and the AI would get all mucked up and they wouldn't engage. This will actually make for stronger AI battles for sure and will make campaign much better. Uh, artillery are far less likely to be sniped during the auto resolver calculation despite having a superior army well that's interesting kills should be more evenly distributed within the auto resolver calculation between similar units that's really good you know auto resolve is a funny thing like i i generally auto resolve about 80 percent of my battles fight fight about 20 percent the most important ones but i do have a percentage and and you know if you play campaign there's sometimes you just want to quickly get to your next turn or move move the campaign along and you know, you just don't want to auto-resolve and even an easy battle because you might lose a unit. Hopefully that fixes some of that. Uh, ranged units will no longer march into melee range when they have no clear line of sights. That is awesome. And that is really big for the Dowie because of the Thunders, which and there are other units that are affected by this, but that's really big. Legendary Lords will now be recruitable when you confederate with that faction when the Lord is in a wounded state. That's really good. I mean, so... In my Mortal Empires campaign, I got every legendary lord, and I had to be careful in order to get Belagai Ironhammer. I had to wait to confederate with them until he was out of a wounded state. If you watch that, it took maybe five or six turns to actually get that done, but uh, I think this will make it just that much better. Savage Orc building chain can now be constructed by Wurzag in minor settlements. Well, that's good. That should make the Savage Orcs even better. The food system has been rebalanced to make it more manageable, which includes the following changes. This is for Skaven. Added some food to exotic animal building chain. Excellent. Modified food gained from Skaven devious planning edict to re and removed income reduction. And added increased food gain from Skaven ascendancy right and added food to top levels of Skaven, Skaven energy building chain. So hopefully this whole food system a makes a skaven more interesting to play i would like to see some more good skaven campaigns and, and there are some out there but they're they 
the whole food mechanic can be pretty punishing I think from the from the campaigns I've seen uh, you know maybe I just haven't seen perfect play but it, it's uh, it should be really fun and interesting and it should you know allow them to make level three settlements and kind of some of the cool stuff on it and so the big thing that I'm hoping for is that it really helps the AI surge because you know right now the you know the vampires are very very strong and they definitely dominate a lot of the parts of the map and you know they did some work to reduce the the wood elf dominance but i would i wouldn't mind it if the skaven started to dominate the map i think that would be actually quite interesting and hopefully this really helps the skaven particularly as the ai to perform well in campaign because Fighting hordes and hordes of Skaven, I think, would be really fun, especially as the Dowie, because they match the Dowie match up so well against the Skaven. So I think that'd be fun, and I hopefully you we really see the results in our Ungram Iron Fist campaign. So technical and performance improvements. So overall lighting balance pass across all battle map environments. Improved SSAO, okay. Improved shadows for better frame rate and benchmarking. So we've already read this once. So gameplay improvements, okay. Well, oh, there's a lot. So fixed several rare end turn crashes okay fix several rare desyncs lowered the imperium level required to trigger the chaos invasion mid and late game events hmm i think that will make the chaos invasions come a little sooner i know they turned that down when they made the changes after mortal empires was released and chaos invasions were so crazy so we'll see if they're just probably trying to get that right. So re-added a turn timeout to the mid and late game events if they aren't triggered by Imperial le Imperium level. Savage Orc building chain can now be constructed. Okay, Legendary Lords, Rude Recruitable. We read that already. Recruitment time reduced by one turn for Black Orcs, Black Orcs Witch Elves, and White Lions of Trace, which is fantastic. Uh, it should make... Hopefully we'll see more Black Orcs in campaign. It's quite rare that you actually see a lot of Black Orcs. In campaign because the AI just can't manage to get there to recruit them uh, which elves and white lines I don't know but I mean these are obviously units that should not be a two-turn unit to recruit for sure and uh, black orcs you could argue that they should be because they are more expensive but I don't think that I you know I think to make the campaigns more interesting and tough you know there you should see a, a few more black orcs both Wood Elf co-op partners now receive the effects of the Oak of Ages. Interesting, okay. Lowered the Amber cost for the final tier of Oak of Ages to 80. I guess just making the Wood Elf campaign uh, a little easier. Grudges that require the assassination of the target have been removed. Yes! <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> that is awesome. This was the most awful grudge. I freaking hated these grudges because there's, you know, when you get that grudge, it's to do it is really difficult. A, because sometimes you'll lose trying to assassinate someone back. You could have your hero killed four or five times. So usually it's just easier to literally wipe the faction off the face of the map than to try and actually complete that grudge. That is awesome. Good job, CA. Thank you very much. Much appreciated from this dwarf. Uh, Tretch Craventail will no longer die when confederating. Hmm, interesting. Magma Master Achievement will now unlock correctly. Okay. Black Arcs no longer suffer from deep water attrition. Well, that's interesting. Uh, you, that makes sense. Black Arcs are quite large. They should be able to sail around the world. Durthu now has the skewering branch and skin of the wood skills. Hmm. We'll see how that works out. Crocars obliterate the undead now affects the Tomb Kings. Well, that makes sense. Replaced Bretonian economy skills. Yield of the Sea, Tenth Share, Bailiff, that encouraged cheesy gameplay, including but not limited to people only ever using Albrick as Marienburg Harbormaster. Hmm, well, I don't know exactly what that means, but I'm sure it's good. Mutant Gits can no longer summon Waz from their garrison forces. Oh... Well, how about that? I didn't know that. Interesting. So <laughs> the mutinous gets their garrisons could fight and then end up having a wah. <laughs> 
Uh, Von Karstein faction will now have to destroy the Empire in their long campaign victory conditions, consistent with their short campaign victory consistence conditions. Well, that makes sense. Several regions have had their climate type changed to more closely match the visuals on the campaign map. Malekith will hate some of these. <laughs> oh, well, poor Malekith. Skaven assassins will no longer spawn with the ability concealment bombs. Okay. The third stage of the Slayer Crown quest should now advance correctly. All right. I know there were some issues with some of the quest chains for <clears throat> Grom Brindle when I ran that that my first Mortal Empires campaign and I had to actually get a mod so they could finish getting his legendary gear but I didn't notice that it was also on Ungram but I've never played a pure Ungram campaign this will be my first the third the hard cap hard cap on sorceresses has been removed okay so you can have as many sorceresses as you as you want now well there's a hard cap on engineers runesmiths and uh, Thanes as well you can only get 10 of each which I don't know why that is but I mean it is what it is I guess death heads monoliths can now be captured correctly correctly by all races on the vortex map which unfortunately there's no dwarves on the vortex map I wish there was uh, or that we can play without an unlocker that is buildings can now be built in Kaurk whatever that is rework parts of the Empire AI to improve performance oh nice and this is actually really good because in a lot of campaigns empire actually does get crushed in the, and i hate to see that i like having empire i like having them strong in my campaigns and you make a good ally and it's it's more consistent with the lore added empire ai victory conditions hmm all right we'll keep going here changed internal diplomacy of ai bretonian factions i wonder if that'll help them not fight each other so much i don't know increased diplomatic aversion between vampires and other factions yeah that makes sense because i i know i had one campaign where i could have actually vassaled the vampire counts so that's good increase the budget for armies and construction across the board for ai factions he that's gonna make <laughs> that's good it's gonna make it much harder uh the ai will be more difficult for sure with increased budget for armies and construction uh, I imagine you'll really see that on Legendary, so we'll see what that looks like with our on our Ungram campaign. Of course, I'm going to play on Legendary, and we'll see what that looks like. Various skill selection fixes for AI factions. Hmm. I don't know what that means exactly. Added unique army templates for AI faction leaders. Awesome! This is fantastic. So what that means is that, for example, uh, Grimgor Ironhide will probably want to recruit more Black Orcs and you know uh, any any of them you will you'll see a lot more unique armies for the faction leaders which is really good your legendary lords you know Starsnick will probably have a lot of a lot of uh, goblins and this sort of thing this should actually make for a very interesting gameplay so sorcery building chain can now be constructed in Altdorf when playing as the Dark Elves. Well, whatever. When attacking an army garrisoned in a settlement, Lightning Strike will no longer prevent the garrison from joining the battle. Oh, I see. That makes sense. So you could Lightning Strike a unit that was sitting in a city so the garrison couldn't actually join the battle. Okay, that actually makes sense. Altered some terrain textures in the Nehekara to be desert instead of badlands. Okay, food system has been rebalanced to make it more manageable, which includes the following changes uh, added. We saw those changes. So battle. All right, so WA has been changed to be map wide a map wide buff with unique visuals. I actually really like that. I think WA is one of those things that you know it was an area of effect, but really in the lore, it's it has crazy effects. It makes green skins insane basically, and I think that's more appropriate for the lore and will make the green skins just tougher to fight the ai will no longer dodge artillery projectiles yay hell cannons homing fixed we'll see what that means uh hell cannons can be pretty pretty powerful as it is so but it is the it is chaos's only artillery piece right now so it has to be reliable i think summon spells that get interrupted during the casting animation will no longer consume a use that is actually good 
It'll make the game harder for us because our enemies often have summons. So ranged units will no longer march into melee yes, when they have clear line of sights. Good. Fixed instances where Skaven AI would attempt to use the menace below on flying units. All right. That's good. Fixed an issue where spellcasters who had reached their own hit point regeneration cap couldn't heal other targets. Oh, interesting. I didn't even know that existed. Fixed an issue when tomb, tomb scorpions could disengage from combat in guard mode. It's probably due to that animation. They have a really giant animation where they go underground. So Dagabos and uh, Beta Night Sneakin will no longer apply the charge bonus to the entire army. Oh, I didn't even know it did that. And it will no longer apply their charge bonuses as static amounts corrected to a percentage increases. Okay. The hill cracks on the map, Tomb of the Shifting Sands, will no longer disappear when the camera is close. Okay. Balthasar Gelt will now be able to hide when on a mount in the woods. Okay. That'll make the Balthasar Gelt builds possibly a little tougher. I don't know. Phoenix Garden White Lines of Trace are now more detailed when zoomed out. Okay. Good. Troops can no longer be moved through some of the rocks in the map. Troll Country. Yeah, Troll Country is a pretty flat map as it is, but I guess it does have rocks on it. So usability improvements. Uh, general. Difficulty sliders have been replaced with drop-down boxes on the race selection screen. Okay, that's good. Fixed incorrect references to faction-wide on Lord selections. Oh, that's actually really good. So, uh... Sometimes when you look at the Lord's, your legendary Lord's abilities, it's hard to tell whether it's just for his army or it's faction wide or anything. So, uh, you know, maybe that will make that a little clearer. So the Necro, the Necro Sphinx is now affected by scale in the laboratory. Cool. Fixed a rare desync with laboratory replays. All right. The unit movement text shown during loadant screens will now fit correctly in its box. All right. So campaign usability improvements. So these are just uh, general improvements unit exchange panel will now show final unit count in each army after the exchange all right a military access icon will now show in place of diplomatic status on the city information bar if appropriate uh i imagine these are yeah these are all campaigns so an icon has been added next to the settlement names to show where landmark pyramids can be built which count towards the long campaign victories in Mortal Empires when playing as Tomb Kings. Interesting. Nobles now correctly give 20% extra resources. Overgyrating Shaman event will no longer trigger on turn 6 every time for the Bloody Hands. Oh, I see. Okay. So that was an event that was always on turn 6. Fixed an instance where the advisor would play a message when playing as Bretonia and couldn't be dismissed. I've actually seen that as a Dwarfs too, but it was rare. I, I can't remember what message it was. Fix multiple instances of buildings being displayed as the wrong tier. Okay. The correct tier will now display on event messages when construction is complete for chaos. Fix some UI overlap with the no notification panel. Okay. Fix a rare instance, rare instance where a storm would not be visible on the campaign map. Oh yeah, that'd be a storm out in the ocean. Okay. Fix a rare issue where a Lord would show too far zoomed out in the character portrait hmm all right techless will now hold his staff correctly in the campaign map when moving yeah whatever um tomb princes will no longer move out of the portrait window when issued when issuing an order <laughs> cool uh eyes of the jungle rogue army will no longer greet the player with a missing string hmm i i don't know what that is Pin feature can now be used on regiments of renown that are on cooldown. Okay, that's good. That's just so you can compare regiments of renown to other units. When you're just looking through your units, you can pin them before you couldn't, I guess. Increased volume on some advice lines that were playing too quietly. Okay, fix an issue where the spell browser would not display correctly in some circumstances for wood elf and vampire counts casters. Okay, the curse will no longer be listed in Archon's abilities when replaced with the Falling Curse. All right, it's just the UI issue. Guardian ability is now correctly listed as a ward save. Holy shit. Guardian is a ward save? That's crazy. So a ward save is defense against all types of damage, magical, physical, or fire, or whatever. The Restless Dead ability is now correctly listed as regeneration. Okay. 
uh, the Lich Staff ability is now correctly listed as a Hex, okay. The, her her the Heretic Jar is now correctly listed as Regeneration. Uh, and that probably means, maybe it wasn't, like, yeah, we'll see. Some common items were disp were displaying, and the rare item icon now correctly show the common item icon. Okay, certain actions still do not have Carl Francis' consent, <laughs> nor will they ever. <laughs> uh... <laughs> oh man, I love you guys. I love you, CA. Thank you for that. The Book of Grudges text will now fit correctly on higher resolutions. Oh, I guess I, it was not fitting correctly, I guess. Removed a duplicate of improved tower projectiles from the description of Tier 2 Fortress Gate. Wakaf of the First Dynasty no longer incorrectly gives a recruitment bonus of plus 2 to Death Hags. Alright. Fix a broken tooltip on the opposing ritual failed event message. Fix a typo on the indomitable will skill. Fix a typo in the description for Totem of Prophecy, Lizardman Banner, and Sack Met's incantation of the Skullstorm skill will now display correctly in Spanish in his skill tree. Okay, so battle. So these are usability improvements. These are just so-called quality of life improvements for battle. Character and unit abilities can no longer be used during deployment. I didn't know they could. I knew they changed those character and unit abilities so that they would be ready the second the battle started instead of having to tick down or go through their full cooldown, but maybe that would, maybe, I didn't know, maybe you could use them and, and you'd go through their 90 seconds sitting in the deployment, which would be unfortunate. Reduced tree density in Dark Elf Forest maps to ease visibility. I actually really like that. There's, there's some maps where the tree density is just too, it's too high. It looks pretty when you look at the map, but it is really difficult to enjoy fighting on those maps. So fix a rare incident instance where when cavalry mounted units would not hit with one of their attacks against certain enemies. Okay. Tretch Cravendale should now bleed when attacked. Well, that's good. Happy day. Let's go beat them up. The AI will now properly reveal themselves during ambush quest battles. Okay. Wildwood Rangers in the Eyes of the Jungle Rogue Army will correctly play their animations. War Hydras in the Dwellers of Zardok Rogue Army will now correctly play their animations. Silver Helms will no longer attempt to block with shield that they don't have when it's under missile fire. There's actually a few units that do that, that will, that will put their arm up as though they're blocking with a shield and they don't have one. Uh, fixed an issue where Cetra's weapon would detach from his hand when riding a chariot after casting a spell. That seems very specific. Cetra's casting visual effects will no longer be offset from his hand. Okay, it looks like they were having problems with his animations as a whole. Uh, sepulchral stalkers will now play the correct animation when chasing units down that are withdrawing from melee. Fixed an issue where Lich Priest staffs would detach and swap hands during a jump attack. Well, that's actually pretty cool, but okay. Skeleton Horsemen, Mounted Yeomen, and Grail Guardians will no longer instantly switch the weapon between hands when idle. Ah, uh, okay, so that was a, just a glitch. Wurzag and Orc Shaman will now transition correctly between idling and walking animations. Okay, so their idling dancing animation probably weren't switching right. Eagle and Hawks will now close their beaks during idle and movement animations. <laughs> those, those, elf, uh, those elf units, they were just all mouth breathers. Fair enough, I guess. Fixed an issue where some Skaven would sometimes open their mouths unnaturally wide. <laughs> Necrotech swords, Necrotech swords, oh, Necrotech swords will no longer disappear when they are attacking on a chariot. Okay. Renald Resurgent, a new new content leaks now seem to happen by default. I don't know what that means. Necropolis Knight Halberds will no longer disappear during a jump attack. Necropolis Knights will now hold their shields correctly when idle. Yeah, a few little things like that, eh? Pistoliers and Outriders will now sheathe their melee weapons when switching between ranged and melee attack. Okay. Melee swing sounds should no longer play when Dread Spears are idling. Added collision to some houses on the Sword of Torgold map. Incorrectly placed Swamp Bubbles have been removed from the Hellpit map. Imagine they were just floating 
in the air or something, although I never did notice them. Fixed an issue where Krell's portrait would not show up correctly after being upgraded. Okay. Hellman's Blight icon now displays correctly. Warhammer 2 factions now show their purple inner coloring on their unit category icon above the unit batter for regiments of renown. Ah, okay. So I guess that purple wasn't showing correctly. Bloodlust tooltip clarified to state that the ability can be used on the Lord as well as allies. All right. So auto resolve improvements. Let's see what they say here. Artillery far less likely to be sniped. Okay, got that. Kill should be more evenly distributed. Yep. We already read that. Reduced advantage of superior factions in the auto resolver. Hmm. I wonder if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So they reduced the advantage of superior factions in the auto resolver. So if you had superior numbers, <clears throat> that means you're going to take more damage back. That's probably correct. You know, you do want to make auto resolve reasonable but you want to make it so that playing the battle by hand is generally going to yield better results than auto resolve you know that you just don't want to have auto resolve unreasonably kill one of your elite units a unit that you clearly would protect so all right fixed a rare instance where melee lords could be assigned to range during an auto resolve or calculation oh interesting i wonder if that ever happened in, to the dao e Fixed an issue where you couldn't auto-resolve against books of Nagash rogue armies at sea if you were unable to withdraw. All right. So audio improvements. So I think those auto-resolve, you know, they, like I like that they've been slowly trying to work on auto-resolve because this is actually something that's extremely, extremely complex to try and run a good calculation. Like I think the auto-resolver is actually, auto-resolving is actually pretty reasonable for what it is to like how how do you set up that formula to calculate those things it's not really easy there's so many things that go into it but generally it's been pretty decent i think uh this auto resolve has been a little overpowered so that you can you're almost better off to auto resolve your way through if you if you want to but i like that they're continuing to try and get this auto resolve right which i just it's really good. It's actually a, a clear sign that they, this game is just has a lot of resources behind it. You know, it's one of those things that you see that make you happy to know that they're doing this because auto resolve, they could have left the auto resolve as it was at launch just fine and just hand it, hand, hand, left it like that. It was overpowered. You know, people, some people didn't like it, but you know, they could have left it because it functioned. But they didn't, and they've they've chosen to keep developing it, which I really like. Uh, audio improvements. So, updated HDR audio settings, so magic and projectiles will stand out in the mix. Oh, that's cool. Implemented new spell targeting sound. Interesting. Implemented new magic arrow sound for elf archers. Well, whatever. Updated the sound triggers on various animations to be more accurate. I see they were desynced, maybe. Updated audio mix for battles across sound effects and music across different camera levels. Oh, interesting. So the closer with your camera, things will change, I guess. Improved memory usage of audio files in battles. Good. That's like a small detail that might sound innocuous, but improving the memory usage, making them cleaner, more streamlined is actually very, very good news. Again, that's one of those small fixes that could very easily just be let go. But this is showing clearly that CA is continuing to develop not just the face of the game, new graphics, new units. They're, they're developing the guts of the game, which is really nice. So lower the probability of taunt vocalizations on some Dark Elf units. Okay. Adjusted the volumes of the ambient sounds for Wood Elf Siege Towers. All right. Fixed Tomb King Chariots using the wrong ground type on water. Fixed Reload Sounds not playing for some pistol weapons. Two-Headed Dragons are now using the correct vocalizations. Change the armor sound used by Elf Mages to better match the in-game model. Cool. Updated the spell, the spell browser audio for the Burning Head spell to match the updated video. Updated the spell browser audio for Usirin's incantations and vengeance spell to match the in-game spell. Reduce the frequency of rock debris sounds on campaign map for various bluffs in the desert regions. Updated some campaign UI sounds to add missing flavor elements for Tomb Kings. Increased the volume of some advice lines that were too quiet and fixed music transitions in some battle tracks. All nice improvements. Good job. 
Unit balancing, here is the big one. So we'll, we'll go and take a look at unit balancing. So in general, halved impact of summoned units on the balance bar. I see. So a lot of times you would see, like, there's the that way you don't have summoned units, but you'd watch. I, I'm a big fan of many channels, especially multiplayer channels, and you see when, you know, a Saigor is summoned or some of these other things, the balance bar just seems to go nuts. So have the impact of summoned units on the balance bar. So the balance bar should be more reasonable. Adjusted RO regiments of renown stats to match new rank 9 unit stats more correctly. Ah, uh, okay. Increased mass for most infantry lords and heroes. Patch notes, will, patch notes will only highlight the biggest changes. So that's potentially good for the Dowie. I know the Dowie have had their mass increased already. So we'll see if it gets to our lords. Pass on heavy, heavy cavalry mount entity mass. All right. So they probably added some mass to the heavy cav. So we'll go to the Tomb Kings first. Doubled the healing amount of Realm of Souls. That's probably a good thing. I mean, I did play the Tomb Kings, and I think Realm of Souls are those tier, those three tier heals, and they don't seem to heal for a whole lot. That should make the Tomb Kings, just especially their skeleton units and and such more value more viable. Right now, I think the strength of the skeleton the Tomb Kings are in their constructs. So that actually is probably good for the Tomb Kings. Archon, the Tomb Blade of Archon now summons a large unit of Skeleton Warriors instead of healing. Actually, that's really good. That was a, you know, that this Tomb Blade of Archon was banned in our tournament and it was very, very powerful in multiplayer. So that's actually a good. Liber Mortis now gives plus eight leadership. The duration is reduced from 20 to 15. Okay, interesting. Cetra, the Kemrian War Sphinx, minus 15 armor, minus 292 health, minus eight charge bonus. So I did have Cetra on his War Sphinx for my Tomb Kings fight in the in Shadows tournament. And I don't know, I mean, that that's a pretty big debuff. Like Cetra is really expensive. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, and Archon was always chosen over Cetra, almost always chosen because of that Tomb Blade of Archon. So maybe this will bring uh, Kalita more into play. Kalita is actually a pretty good lord. Cetra is just really expensive. I, I think debuffing this War Sphinx might actually cause some problems. I mean, you might not see him as much. But the Chariot of the Gods seems to got a, a bit of a buff. Minus 5 melee attack, minus 3 melee defense. Not a buff, but plus 35 AP damage, plus 5 bonus versus infantry. Interesting, okay. Plus 15 base melee damage. All right, so basically they're making the Chariot of the Gods more effective versus infantry and less effective versus cavalry. So they're really trying to slot that Chariot into a very specific to be more useful in in its desired role taking away base melee attack and adding bonus versus infantry interesting okay tomb king cameron war sphinx mount minus 15 armor okay minus 292 health minus eight charge bonus kalita necro serpent plus 350 mass whoo oh my god so kalita you're gonna see kalita i mean she was okay before uh, but with that extra mass that means she's going to be able to get through <clears throat> front lines a little easier not like she had a hard time because she had, does have kind of an explosion but you only get three uses of that so the Kemrian war sphinx minus 15 army armor minus 40 health minus eight charge bonus i suppose that's probably right i don't know uh you know they're really debuffing that war sphinx necro sphinx minus 10 armor minus 408 health minus eight charge bonus minus seven melee defense plus three melee attack well that's a big nerf that is a really big nerf. Minus, they're basically, yeah, okay. Well, I, I suppose that's good. We'll see. The Sphinx of Usep, minus 10 armor. Wow, they are really hitting the Tomb Kings hard here. And it's not like the Tomb Kings were an overpowered faction, but they did tend to be more focused on their, their constructs. So... And those contracts, those constructs are not cheap. Like this is a, for a unit that is that expensive, you know, we'll see. The Hero Titan, minus 10 armor, minus 7 melee defense. Holy. 
Skeleton Chariots, minus 150 multiplayer costs. Ouch. That's actually, that's good for the Tomb Kings. That's bad for everybody else. We're going to see more Chariots. Skeleton Archer Chariots, minus 150 multiplayer costs. So they are really trying to push towards their base units and a little bit away from their, their, their uh, constructs. We'll see how that plays out. These are, these are not small changes. Blessed Legion of Fox, minus seven melee attack, minus three melee defense. All right, that's the that's the skeleton archers that sunder armor. The King Nikesha Scorpion Legion, minus twenty, minus one charge bonus, minus six melee attack, minus one melee defense. The Sepulchral Stalkers are Regiment of Renown, minus one melee attack, plus six melee defense. Tomb Scorpions, minus ten armor, minus three twenty health. Okay, Tomb Scorpions are really they're. I think they're one of the best pound for pound units that the Tomb Kings had. You know, they are low to the ground, they move fast, they're hard to hit. You know, they have great animations for getting through, so you know, we'll see. Ushapti minus 10 armor. Okay, Ushapti great bows minus 10 armor. Chosen of the Gods minus 10 armor minus 5 melee attack plus 2 melee defense. So, they're just making these Ushapti a little more vulnerable, which is I don't know, like when I played the Dark Elves against Ragnarok's Tomb Kings, you, like I got, shoot, we got some uh, Harpies in there fighting these Ushapti and they did just fine. So I don't know if that was needed, but we'll see. You know, they have better stats. Necropolis Knights plus 350 mass. So that's actually a good thing. We should see more Necropolis Knights. Screaming Skull Catapult, slightly increased accuracy. That was badly needed. That catapult was awful for its accuracy i don't think it'll you're not going to see it as the dowie because it's it has magic attacks and the dowie have 25 percent magic resistance so it's unlikely you're going to see that on the battlefield anyways so we'll see um vampire accounts so hex wraiths plus two health per entity that's actually probably a good thing karen wraiths plus two health per entity. Again, a good thing. I think Hex Wraiths and Karen Wraiths are units I'd like to see more of, to be perfectly honest. And, you know, I think that you don't see them just because they are very, very vulnerable to magic. And anything that does magic damage, like you see, they're a really cool unit, but they just, they don't have, they're not durable enough to get what they need to get done so this is plus two health per entity is a pretty big deal like this is not a small amount so this actually re should really help the vampire counts uh, in their army quite a bit so I, I like that vampire counts I think I don't know if they're underpowered but I think they maybe the, the vampire counts are sort of war sort of a one-trick pony from what I've seen so may, hopefully that helps bring those units into play because I would like to see more Hex Wraiths and Karen Wraiths. Direwolf plus 7 health per entity plus 4 charge bonus. That's a big deal. Dire Pack plus 7 health per entity plus 4 charge bonus minus 2 melee defense. All right. Terror Geist minus 100 health minus 2 charge bonus. So you see the Vampire accounts have that 2 Terror Geist, double Terror Geist with the Red Duke build, which is sort of their build. So minus 100 health, minus two charge bonus. So t we'll temper that a little bit. Uh, Vampire Lord, plus four melee attack, plus 30 AP melee, and plus 20 base melee. All right, that's going to bring them up a little bit. Now, the Vampire Counts have a lot of lords to choose from, not, but not a lot of good lords to choose from, from what I've seen. So the Vampire Lord, Bartered Nightmare, plus four melee attack, plus 30 AP, plus 20 base. Uh, the Hellsteed, sort of the same stats, plus four melee attack, plus 30 armor piercing melee damage, plus 20 base melee damage. So they're making the basic Vampire Lord a little better. Uh, I still don't know that you'll ever see, you will see many Vampire Lords unless they're mounted. Uh, but you might. Manfar Manfred Von Karstein, plus four melee attack, minus 50 cost, plus 30 AP melee, and plus 20 base melee. Wow. So you're going gonna to see more Ma Manfred. That's for sure. Those, like, plus four melee attack, plus 30 AP, plus 20 base. That's really good. So on a Bartered Nightmare, 
uh, same stats and on a Hellsteed, the same stats. So Helmund Gorst, the Lieber Noctis now deals an average of 30% less damage to self, okay. Krell, plus 20 bonus versus large, holy crap, that is lots. Plus 5 hit reaction ignore chance, okay. Plus 5 knock interrupt chance, okay. Plus 450 mass, holy Krell's going to be a lot more useful. Removed wind-up time from Lord of Undeath. Okay, the White King. Plus 14 bonus versus infantry. Ooh, man. You're going to see some White Kings, that's for sure. That's a big bonus. 14 bonus to infantry. It's not so much on the damage the White Kings are going to do, but on their ability to hit something. Chillgeist, plus 2 health per entity. Plus, minus 2 melee defense. Maybe. We'll see. Varix Reavers, minus three melee defense. Now, the Varix Reavers have regeneration, so they might be a little easier to to DPS down. The Strigoi Ghoul King on a Terrorgeist, minus 32 health. All right. Va Vlad Von Karstein, plus four melee attack, plus... Th so they're making their lords, all their lords, a little bit better. Added Arcane Conduit and Multiplayer. The Feasters in the Dusk, minus two melee defense. That's a straight-up nerf. The Konigstein Stalkers, minus 3 melee defense, minus 50 cost. Interesting. Um, hmm. That's like, so 50, 50 gold for 3 stat points is about on par with a 1 Chevron. So that's close. Like, I don't know if they're, you know, they're going to be cheaper. They're going to have a little less melee defense. Sternsman, minus 3 melee defense. So that's probably good. This, uh, now, the Sternsmen are an amazing unit. And I've done some testing, very little amount of testing with them. And you can see how strong the Sternsmen are. I think they are a must pick. And you've seen, you know, units like the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass have got nerfed and nerfed and nerfed. And, uh, you know, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit because I love my Dowie. But the Sternsmen were, were very strong. That minus three melee defense, I think... Is probably appropriate because they are pretty much a must include on any vampire accounts army if you ask me because they are just that good they are really really strong the tithe minus one melee defense okay the devils of Swartoffen minus two melee defense plus 10 AP, AP armor piercing melee damage minus 10 base melee damage so that's a net buff for sure with that AP melee the minus two melee defense will just make them a little more easy a little squishier Vargeist plus 10 AP plus 10 armor piercing melee damage minus 10 base melee damage again that's a net buff for sure you're getting 10 damages going through unless every single time unless the unit they're hitting has physical resistance versus 10 damage that can be mitigated by armor so that's a that's a that's a net that's just straight up buff mortis engine reliquary corruption aura now deactivates out of melee so I saw that so mortis engines which is a little annoying actually could just drive around behind the vampire's line and drain your troops and it was for, like for the dowie you know if you don't have like if you don't have ranged units they're impossible to flank right um but now the mortis injury engine has to actually be in melee combat to get its drain which is good claw of nagash minus one melee defense and the corruption area now de deactivates on a melee so that's actually really good the Red Duke. Now, this was the most common lord you saw, I think, for the vampire counts. Maybe the one, the most common one I remember. Maybe it's not the most common one used. It's, but I've seen the Red Duke used quite a bit. Uh, on foot, plus ten charge bonus, plus twenty melee a a AP melee, plus thirty. Whoa, geez, he's just getting better. <laughs> Barded Nightmare, plus ten charge bonus, plus twenty armor piercing melee, plus thirty base melee, and the same on the Hell Steed and vampires all. Oh, so this is just the base vampire unit. Plus 50 cost, plus 30 AP melee damage, plus 20 mace. Holy crap. So they are a little more expensive, but 30 armor piercing damage is, and plus 20 melee base damage is a lot. You're going to see more vampires for sure. I don't know if they're going to be useful, but you'll see them. Vargos, minus 50 cost. Okay, I think that's good. Skeleton Spearman, minus 25 cost. What? Ah. <sighs> You know that at they cost right now uh, skeleton spearmen three hundred, so they're going to be two seventy five. I think that's probably reasonable. Like they aren't as powerful as the tomb king spearmen, but 
at 300, they could beat our miners pretty handily, and now they're going to be 275, and they're going to beat our miners pretty handily. We'll see if we we'll we'll see what it gets to, but I think that's probably good. Skeleton spearmen, you should see lots of them. Oh, man, oh, skeleton spearmen. This is not just skeleton warriors. I was thinking of skeleton warriors. So minus the 25 cost, okay, good enough. I think uh, that's fine. Blood knights plus two armor piercing melee damage plus 330 mass. Whoo. That's a pretty big deal. That two armor piercing is really going to help blood knights in in combat against other armored cav, and that plus three thirty mass is going to make them hit quite a bit harder. So we're going to blood knights. You see pretty frequently already. So that's just a straight up buff. They're just going to be that much better, and they should be. They're pretty expensive, and I think they're they might be the only anti large op option for cavalry for the vampire count. So they have to be dependable at what they do. Really, they do. Dark Elves. All right. So Death Hag on foot, minus 15 missile resistance, plus 20 physical resistance. Lots of big buff. Because if you think about it, even if you're you're shooting with uh, Quarrelers, they're going to net out plus 5 resistance to damage because they do physical damage. And that plus 20 physical resistance means the Death Hags are going to be able to get right in the middle of combat and last that much longer. I think Death Egg is common on their cauldron because of the fear and terror. So Death Egg, Blood Cauldron, Blood Shield of Cain change for plus eleven percent physical resistance to six percent physical resistance. So well, that's a net that's a big nerf. But I think that was an area of effect. The Dreadlord Sword and Shield on a Black Dragon plus four melee attack. The Dreadlord Sword and Crossbow plus four melee attack on a black dragon. Yay, we'll see more dragons. Malekith on a cold one chariot. Plus three melee attack, minus eight melee defense, minus two bonus versus infantry, plus 70 armor piercing damage, plus 30 base melee damage. So what are they tr attempting to do with him on a chariot? You know, he's getting a lot more damage, like a lot more damage. But he's a little squishier. So I guess it's more risk reward and, le and taking away a little bit of bonus versus infantry. They're really trying to say don't stay in melee combat for as long but i've seen malekith on a chariot already so that's just going to make that a much better option i think that three melee attack and the extra damage is going to be make him pretty pretty devastating in that thing so sorceress on a cold one remove primal instinct ability all right i think that's a good idea that, that i think that could be pretty annoying if you because i i was thinking of bringing a sorceress but it was really annoying because you know having the Having your mount in rage would be unbelievably annoying. Keenite Assassin plus 20, plus 20 AP melee damage. All right. So Keenite Assassin I looked at. I, you don't see them a whole lot, but that's probably a good thing to up their melee damage. Cold One Dread Knights minus 50 cost. I think that's good. That'll bring them down from, I think they're 1,000 to 950. Or no, wait. That's Cold One Knights. So Dread Knights are maybe the more expensive version. So hopefully that'll bring them more into play. Shades with dual weapons, minus 50 cost. Shades with great swords, minus 50 cost. We're going to see more shades. We'll see if they hold. And the Hydra Fiery Breath now targets unit center by default. Well, I hope that's the same with all the artillery as well because that is so annoying when your artillery targets the, the edge of a unit instead of the center. So hopefully the this is, you see this with all artillery as well. It's a good thing. Good, I'm glad they're getting the hydras getting that. It absolutely needs that for fire damage. So let's see what they're gonna do to the lizard men. All right, Krokgar on foot plus 600 mass. Whoo! He's gonna be able to get around. Horned ones plus one melee attack plus 100 mass. All right, horned ones are something you didn't see a lot. Now I, I've seen Loremaster Sotek use them to good effect. He does like them, but I think they are a little bit weak for their cost. This is just going to make them a little bit better. Like, plus one melee attack isn't nothing. And that that extra mass is good as well. So, Crocker on Grimlock, minus 412 health, minus 8 charge bonus. Okay, so that's going to make Crocker on Grimlock, you know, that's a pretty substantial reduction in capability. And that's the, pretty much, you don't see Crocker on anything but Grimlock for most, most games. And you rarely see Crocker on foot. So 
Maybe you're going to see him on a horned one. Maybe you're going to see him on foot sometimes with that extra mass. Hard to say. So a Sour's Old Blood on a Carnosaur, minus 396 health, minus 8 charge bonus. So they're really, this whole Crocker plus a Sour's Old Blood going in and gooning something is going to be a little bit less effective. It's still going to be effective. I mean, these these units are still scary as hell, but it's going to be a little less effective. So a Scar, a Scar Veteran on a Carnosaur, minus 376 health, minus 8 charge bonus. Feral Carnosaur, minus 374 health, minus 8 charge bonus. So a Skink Priest on a Pterodyne, on a Pterodyne, ugh, on a Pterodon, increased Rider Projectile Hitbox. Oh, that's good. Gonna make them easier to hit. Skink Chief, minus 5 AP Missile Damage, minus 5 Missile Base Damage. Good. This whole idea of putting a Skink Chief up in the air with 100 ammo and just killing something over time is really annoying. Skink Chief on a Pterodyne, a oh, Pterodyne, <laughs> a Pterodon, increase the rider, rider projectile hitbox. So this will actually make them more of a target in the air, easier to hit. I like that. Croxagores plus three AP me melee damage, minus, plus one base melee. So this is actually, a, I think, a good change. I think they probably actually also need Croxagores, from what I saw, better melee attack and melee defense aside from their damage because I mean if you leave them alone they can do pretty good but they're quite easy to focus down. Saurus Warriors plus 30 mass okay that's pretty good. Saurus Spearman, Spearman plus 2 melee defense plus 30 mass and that's actually good so one of the things I noticed with Spearman is they're actually not very good so it's always almost always better to go with Temple Guard and that's no, I mean, I don't know that for sure, but I found it was better. And you'd think the Spearman would do pretty good at a cost of 750 or 800, but they're just not that great. So the two melee defense is good. I think that that mass and melee defense is good. And Temple Guard plus 20 mass. Temple Guard are just a good all-around unit. They're probably priced just right. So we're going to take a look at the high elves. Princesses, all plus 30 AP missile damage, plus 20 base missile damage. So you might see some princesses on there. Prince on a Sun Dragon, minus 100 cost. So... The, you're going to see that Walmart Dragon a little more often. Minus 100 cost for the Sun Dragon. Tyrion, plus 1 run speed, plus 2 charge speed. All right. Mage, Ithelmar Chariot, minus 1 collision attack, max targets. Okay, so they're just going to make that Ithelmar Chariot a little less devastating. Not that I know, noted it was, but apparently it was. Skaven, oh, I already see what happens to Skaven. All right, Plague Priests. Um... Plague Furnace, minus 10 armor, good. Billowing Death Aura now deactivates out of melee. Excellent. So that's just like the Claw of Nagash. So these things have to be in melee to, to do damage. Mind you, these Plague Furnaces got a really annoying animation, and they are hard to kill unless you have ranged on them. So I think the Plague Furnace is still going to be outstanding. But minus 10 armor and... Taking that will help. Death Glow Bombardiers, plus one explosion base damage, plus three explosion AP damage. Woo! We're going to see more of them, guys. Warp Fire Throwers, plus two explosion base, plus one explosion AP. All right. So Warp Fire Throwers are not very good, but you might see them now a little more. Plague Clock Catapulting, slightly increased accuracy. Okay. You know, look at the Skaven Artillery is pretty good, but the, you see the, uh, not the Catapult, the other one. The warp lightning cannon a lot more often because it's quite accurate but that plague claw catapult's not that bad and when it hits it does some damage so i think that's actually a good thing the gutter runner slingers both plus two missile ba base damage and night runner slingers plus one missile base damage all right so there's given a little better missile damage some small tweaks to the skaven all right so let's take a look at the warriors of chaos archaeon on foot plus 750 mass okay i actually like all these mass increases for your heroes I, I like the idea of being able to move heroes around unless they are specifically tied down by a unit that's meant to tie them down so archeon on durgar plus 12 run speed plus 300 mass actually i think that's good too might see archeon the ever chosen a little more often chaos lord all plus five leadership all right Chaos Sorcerer Lord on a Manticore, plus, ooh, plus 164 health, plus 25 armor piercing melee damage, and plus 40 mace, base melee. You're going to see more of these. Chaos Lords on a Manticore. Chaos Sorcerer on a Manticore, plus 45 melee, and plus our eight armor piercing melee damage, plus 65 base melee damage. Ooh, you're going to see more of those too. 
Exalted Heroes on foot, plus 260 health, plus 4 leadership. Exalted Heroes on a Steed, plus 10 armor, plus 384 health, plus 4 leadership. Exalted Hero, hero on a Bardic Chaos Steed, plus 384 health, plus 4 leadership. And Exalted Hero on Manticores, plus 164 health, plus 4 leadership, plus 15 AP melee damage, and plus 15 base melee damage. Chaos Feral Manticore, plus 10 AP damage, plus 5 base melee. So <clears throat> we're definitely... They're getting a boost to their heroes and their manticores. Col and Kolek is getting a big nerf. Oh, that is big. So minus 432 health and minus 8 charge bonus for Kolek. So Kolek was, like really, Kolek was the pick, I think, for the Warriors of Chaos. And then Sathoral, the Sathoral, I think, was pretty big. So, oh, here we go. Sathoral, the Everwatcher, reduced collision height increased projectile hitbox and added arcane conduit so arcane conduit is good it's like it's a demon increase the projectile hitbox okay i think that makes sense but they like sathoral has like 60 percent missile resistance so okay reduced collision height i don't know exactly what that means but dragon ogre shagoths they're they were very good minus 430 health minus eight charge bonus dragon ogres plus five armor plus 34 health per entity Okay, so the single entity, the Dragon Ogre Sh Shagoth, has gotten weak along with Kolak. Now, this may be, we'll see how this plays out, but uh, yeah, you, you'd see Kolak and a Dragon Ogre and some together to goon. Dragon Ogres themselves, you know, we saw in our match against Shadow Online Gaming that we were able to take down Dragon Ogres pretty quickly with a Pterodon Rider. Marauder Horseman with Javelins, plus 25. They don't have javelins. I thought the Marauder Horsemen have throwing axes. Plus 25 cost. Well, good. Okay. Hell Cannons now uses a fixed tra trajectory corrected by corrected by homing. Improves the projectile homing. Okay. So Hell Cannons are better. Kolek and Dragon Ogres are still good, but they're going to be more vulnerable. And Archaeon is better. The Chaos Lords are better, the Chaos Sorcerer Lords are better, the Sorcerers are better on the Manticores, Manticores are better. So you're going to see some Manticores against Chaos. Greenskins. Alright. Wa is now a map-wide ability that gives plus 26 melee attack, plus 18% charge bonus, and plus 24% speed for 30 seconds, which recharges in melee. Alright, interesting. So it's not going to, it used to be plus 44, so that plus 26 is still strong, you know, like 26 melee attack is, is actually huge, but now it goes to everyone, which is even better. So you're going to see pretty much standard green skins are going to come in and they're going to click WA as the front lines engage because that 18% charge bonus and 24% speed would be a pretty big deal. So Wurzeg added WA, which is good because he didn't have it, which is odd. Wurzeg's war paint changed from 11% physical resistance to 6% physical resistance. Interesting. So I'm making that a little weaker. And they, I saw that on another character. I think that was the... On the Dark Elves. Goblin Great Shaman added Wa ability in MP. Okay, good. Grimgore, plus 500 mass, plus 3 melee defense. Good. Hopefully we see more Grimgore. I really like Grimgore. You know, he's a fun lord to fight and, and to watch. Holy Skarsnik. Plus 1,300 mass. Gobla has been eating a lot of stunties. Ooh, that's a low blow. He hasn't been eating stunties. He's eating whatever those damn goblins eat. I liked you for the whole Carl Franz stuff there, CA, but I'm not happy about this whole stunties thing. Okay, Orc Boar Boys. Plus 2 melee attack. Okay, I think that's a good idea. Savage Orc Boar Boy Big Guns. Plus 2 melee attack, plus 100 mass. Savage Orc Boar Boys, plus 2 melee attack, plus 100 mass. Okay, I like that. I think that's all good. Like, I think their cav is a little bit underpowered, and they don't have a lot of cavalry options. I mean, the Greenskins are a good faction. This is just going to... Like, I like these kind of tweaks. The Hammer of Gork, minus 4 melee attack, minus 2 melee defense. <laughs> Was the Hammer of Gork overpowered when you detached their crew and went and fought? <laughs> I guess it was. Uh, broken Tusk Mob. Plus, minus 3 melee attack, plus 3 melee defense, plus 2 leadership. Okay, so they're making the Broken Tusk Mob just a little more tanky, just a little better in in prolonged engagement by giving them leadership. Gotcha. 
Death Creepers, minus five melee attack, minus one melee, minus five melee attack, minus one melee attack? Probably melee defense. Dirk at Squigs, minus two melee defense. So they're just making these a little bit uh, squishier. The Mangy Marauders. So th these are, the Mangy Marauders are pretty much a, a must pick unit. And they, you've seen that they have, a, if units are really picked in every matchup, they have been nerfing them. And they've done that with uh, the Dowie. So the Mangy Marauders, minus five melee attack, minus one melee defense, plus one leadership. Well, you know, they haven't nerfed their, the Mangy Marauders, I think, shoot, right? So they haven't nerfed their, their projectile weapons. They just made them a little bit easier to beat up, maybe, or a little less deadly when they charge. Moon Howlers. Now these Moon Howlers, are, I think, cause fear or terror, one of the two. Minus three melee attack, plus one melee defense, minus 50 cost. Interesting. So you're probably going to see them, even though their melee attack is lower, at minus 50 cost, the ability to have a terror-causing unit in the back line is pretty good for the greenskins, actually. The Teef Robbers, I think those are the Chariots, plus three melee defense, so they're going to be a little more tanky. Okay, the Eight Peak Loonies, minus four melee attack, plus one melee defense. All right, the Rusty Arrows, minus four melee attack. All right, let's see. This. The Warlords boys minus two melee defense plus four leadership. The Crimson Killers plus two leadership. I think that's a good idea. The Crimson Killers, they're a very good unit, but I really don't think they should be routing much. Like they're meant to be top tier. The Venom Queen minus four melee attack. Oh, don't they mean like the Spider Queen? Or no, the maybe they call it maybe it is the Venom Queen, the Arachnorock Queen. Minus four melee attack, plus one melee defense. So a little more tanky, a little less damage, and the goblin rock lobber slightly increased accuracy. I think that's good. You don't see a whole lot of goblin rock lobbers. You see the, the regiment of renown. All right. Well, so I think that's a pretty reasonable. It should, you know, the greenskins are not in a bad place, but I like these small changes. And, and WA, I think, I think that's a really good change for WA. I, I actually like it more. I mean, it'll be harder to fight against, to be perfectly honest, having it map wide and doing those things, but it's thematic, right? And players that are playing the green skins that make very, very good use of their wall will, will really be able to get the most out of that. And I think that's actually a good thing. I like that. What else? We'll see if they've done anything to... No, they, they haven't. Interesting. So to, uh, what's that unit? Way, way Stalkers? I don't know. Uh, forest Stalker, Forest Melee Defense Modifier change from plus 20 to plus 15 percent. Okay, so when the Forest, forest Stalker, uh, it's interesting, it didn't, I didn't say how much Forest Stalker actually changed things anywhere, I don't think. So the Melee Defense Modifier changed from plus 20 percent to plus 15 percent. So what else being a forest in a forest is not as good a thing as it was. All right, Ancient Treeman, minus 432 health, the same with Durthu. Okay, so Durthu got some abilities, so we'll see how that plays out. So Durthu will be less likely to be picked. Orion, plus 15 bonus versus large, plus 134 AP missile damage, plus 30 base missile damage. So really what they've done is you, they've changed, uh, want to make Orion get into the meta a little more, Durthu a little less of a choice. So Wild Riders, minus 100 mass. I think that makes sense. It's just like elves on on uh, elves on anything shouldn't have a lot of mass. But sisters of the thorn, max two unit uses of shield of the thorns, max one use of curse of and rare and rare, whatever. Sister of the thorn are a unit that I think I, I I think actually Janet on occasion really brought them into the meta or made them more popular, and they're a very good unit. And so he'll be sad I think about that. We'll see what he says. Hopefully he goes over it. So that's it for the Wood Elves, the Beastmen. All right, Kazrak. We've got plus 650 mass. Dark Mail now always affects wizards in a 40 meter radius rather than relying on them to be casting inside the range. Debuff changed to minus 18 armor and minus 9 melee defense. Yeesh. So your Kazrak is going to be good against the Dowie. Kazrak on a Razor Gore Chariot. Added Vanguard deployment. Okay, that's cool. Uh, you'll see Kazrak on some funny, on some fun and interesting builds. Then, if he's got Vanguard, plus two melee attack, plus forty armor piercing melee damage, minus one collision attack mass targets, 
plus 10 base melee damage, plus 0.2. So his melee attack interval is a little bit longer. So he's gotten some buffs, but that plus 2, I think it's, what, 3.9 seconds? So he'll go to 4.1 seconds. So that's like 0.25%, a 5% reduction in his damage. And he's got plus 2 melee attack, which is a 2% increase in in his chance to hit. 40 AP on his melee damage, he's probably, if he does armor piercing, he's probably got like 300. Minus 1 collision. So he's he's actually going to be quite a bit worse against melee, uh, against infantry blobs. Alright, the Beast Lord, Razor Gore Char Chariot, plus 2 melee attack. Replace Call of Violence with Apocalyptic Vision, plus 40 AP melee damage, minus one collision on max targets, plus 10 base melee damage, plus two melee interval. And the Brace Shaman on the Chariot, minus one collision attack max targets, plus two melee attacks. So that's just a straight up nerf to Brace Shamans on the Chariots, but you might see more Chariots, we'll see. Minotaur is all, plus two charge bonus. I like it, Minotaur should have a good charge bonus. Feral Manticores, plus 10 AP armor piercing melee damage, plus 5 base melee damage. Okay. Centigors, minus 50 mass. Okay, so that's actually, I wonder, that'll be across all Centigors, I think. That, uh, that, that may hurt. Now, Centigors are awesome, but if you have anything that can, like Quarlers or anything that can put some damage into them, they, they get chewed up pretty fast. Cygors, slightly reduced accuracy. Hooray. Cygors are still like they're really extremely good and and you know So I'm glad to see that actually The Empire this should be interesting. Oh, and there's a lot for the Empire. All right, so the Empire You know, I did try to play the Empire When I played in that tournament, but I found they just didn't feel very good and I know a lot of people have had had issues with the Empire and you've seen this Belthazar Gelt double witch hunter build which is sort of a meme build. It's it's effective but they, they have lots of issues I think with their infantry and their high level infantry namely ho we'll see hopefully they do something with uh, great swords and maybe some other stuff but we'll see what they've done here. I'm glad to see they're getting some real love. All right, Balthasar Gelt, Barded Warhorse, added Hide in the Forest. Okay, Warhorse, hide, hide in the Forest. Empire Wizards, all. Change the Channeling Staff item to New Scroll of Blast item. I don't know how much that'll mad, matter. Boris Toddbringer, all. Oh, all his, him and all his mounts, plus five leadership. Boris Toddbringer is already good. I hope they do a lot for Karl Franz. Bor so Boris Toddbringer on a Barded Warhorse, even more armor. So Karl Franz, plus three melee defense, good. Witch Hunter, added immune to psychology, that's good. Witch Hunter should be immune to the psychology. Added magical attacks, good. That'll make the Witch Hunter, Hunter a lot weaker against the war dwarves, but magical attacks make sense. Reduced missile penetration, I think that's good. Now you would see these Witch Hunters would get like 100 kills because their missile penetration. I think missile penetration has to do with how many ranks of units it can go through. So they were getting tons of kills and which like compared to like a master engineer which get no kills uh, like you know doesn't they basically kill twice as many a witch hunter than a master engineer so that's actually good and that was probably from the missile penetration so accusation how has a max of 3 uses I think a lot of people saw that coming you know it's that's going to be no no surprise to anyone um that's much like what they did with the rune smith and the rune lord the Empire Captain, Bartered Warhorse, plus 5 armor. Empire General, Bartered Warhorse, plus 5 armor. Warrior Priest, all, plus 35 armor. E, plus 100 cost. Were Warrior Priests that good? I don't know. No, maybe if they gave the Warrior Priests, made them armor-piercing units instead of... I don't know, it doesn't seem reasonable to me, but maybe they were that good. I don't have all the data. Empire Knights, plus 50 mass. Rake's Guard plus 50 mass. Knights of the Blazing Sun plus 50 mass. Uh, Crossbowman. Now this is pretty big. Plus 1 AP missile damage minus 1 base. That's actually really good. So they're trading 1 armor piercing damage for 1 base. So that's just going to more damage is going to get through. Oh, Handgunners. Plus 1 AP missile damage. Armor piercing missile damage. And plus 1 base missile damage. So you're going to see more Handgunners. 
Great cannons, slightly increased accuracy. They were they were losing accuracy. I think that's probably good. Steam tank, interesting. Ooh, nice. Oh, I like this. So we'll see if we see a steam team. Like I know steam tanks are sort of a meme unit and they're not really used, but they're getting plus 1500 health and they are unbreakable, minus five melee attack, but plus 15 bonus versus infantry. So hopefully we see more steam tanks. I mean, I they would be pretty devastating against the Dao if they're really good and you don't bring anything to deal with them. But you, as, as a dwarf, you do have something that can deal with steam tanks. I would like to see steam tanks more of a thing. I think that's really good. So Luminarch of Hish, plus two ammo, minus 95 armor piercing missile damage, minus five, 55 base missile damage, minus 30 explosion base damage, minus 70 explosion AP damage, improved long range accuracy, minus one second reload time, minus 400 cost so they're chained this out giant so these aren't even all the changes i'll finish them off here aura protection now gives plus 12 word save what in a 40 meter radius and deactivates when available magic power is below 15 locus of hish now passively reduces enemy magic power recharge rate by minus 20 percent for each wizard in play interesting so hmm i mean these are a massive nerfs these are massive nerfs. Minus 95 AP missile. Like the Luminarch of Hish could two shot a lot of heroes. Huh. But basically, they're getting a minus 150 missile damage and explosion damage. They're getting a minus 100 explosion damage, but minus 400 costs. But they're getting better DPS with minus one second reload time. So they're going to reload more quickly. But with the aura protection and the recharge rate to wizards they might be i don't think you're going to see them as the dawi but you might see the luminarch of hish in they might be make more sense in more situations now we'll see the temple hof luminarch which is basically the re regiment of renown for the luminarch of hish same sort of debuffs minus 95 ap minus 55 base missile damage minus 30 explosion minus 70 explosion ap damage improved long range accuracy minus one second base reload time plus four melee attack minus three melee or plus three melee defense minus 300 cost ability changes as above so we'll see how this plays out hopefully we see more luminarchs just as an interesting unit minus 400 cost they, these units were very expensive like 2500 or 2000 plus somewhere in there so you'll see them you'll see people play them i don't know if they'll they'll how good they'll do what hammer the witches oh you're gonna see the hammer of a witches so i guess as the dowie when you're playing empire well it does it does magic damage so you might not but you're gonna see the hammer of the witches more often minus four melee attack plus, minus two melee defense doesn't matter but minus 100 cost it's a pretty big deal slightly increased accuracy so they've gotten cheaper and more accurate and it does magic damage so you're gonna see the hammer of the witches more often sunmaker minus four melee attack minus two melee defense I guess it's just making that easier for uh, artillery to get beat down. But minus 150 cost, I think that's good. Slightly reduced accuracy, okay. Projectile now 70% AP damage. Explosion damage is now 70% armor piercing. Oof. Minus 20 explosion base damage, plus 20 explosion AP damage, plus one detonation radius. Holy crap. That Sunmaker, I think, has 480 range too, as well. So you're gonna, you're going, we're gonna see that as the Dowie, that Sunmaker, most likely. Hellstorm rocket battery minus 150 cost. Wow. And the same idea, projectile now 70% AP minus 20 explosion base damage plus 25 explosion AP damage plus one debt. Oh my God, the Hellstorm rocket battery was still no. I'm thinking of the Hellblaster Volley Gun. The Hellblaster Volley Gun was still pretty good. Holy sheep shit. The Hellstorm Rocket Battery is the one I think with uh, 480 range. Oh my god. Oh my god. Empire's artillery is just gonna is getting a massive buff. Hellblaster Volley Gun was good. Minus, 100 co minus 100 cost plus 6 AP missile damage plus 4 base missile damage. Now it's going to be really strong so that's interesting so this is going to make a big difference from this basically you look from this whole section is artillery you know more or less 
plus their crossbow and handgunners. Like, you just look at this section. Empire just got a whole lot better in terms of ranged. Now, I know their their infantry is... I mean, their spearmen are really good, but their infantry in generally underperform, but boy, are they getting some tools. But this is going to push them heavily into artillery and ranged. Like, handgunners, like, plus one AP and plus one base missile damage, Those are that's a pretty big buff. And the crossbowmen, plus one AP, minus one base, That that's a... That's a buff. I mean, just a straight up buff, which is good. I, you know, I think the this is going to make the Empire much more interesting. And you did see a lot of Empire armies that didn't use any kind of artillery at all. So now you're going to see some of these. And they have really cool artillery, like the, the Hellstorm rocket battery, Hellblaster volley gun, the Temple, the Tempelhof of Luminarch, the Tempelhof Luminarch. You know, like these are really cool things. Steam tank is awesome looking an interesting idea so this is really going to change the way empire plays very significantly and we haven't even gotten all the way down here so all right so the royal altdorf griffites minus four melee attack plus three melee defense so a little more tanky in prolonged melee but doing less damage so the zintler's reichsguard minus two charge bonus minus three melee attack plus three melee defense plus two leadership again a little more tanky they're going to last longer in battle with that extra leadership sigmar's sons Minus two melee defense, minus 50 cost. Sigmar Suns are annoying as hell as it is because it's hard to get rid of them. So they're getting even cheaper. Minus two melee defense, I mean, minus 50 cost. It's a net buff. You know, that's definitely a buff. 50 cost for two stat points at that level. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a small buff. But Sigmar Sons were a useful unit because they're unbreakable. Silver Bullets, minus two melee defense, plus one base missile damage. Okay, so Silver Bullets are, they're a good unit as it is. They're just going to be easier to kill with minus two melee defense. And they're going to be do more damage with that plus, plus one base missile damage. Sterling's Revenge, minus four melee attack, minus 25 cost. So that's a definite nerf. Uh, but Sterling's Revenge are a ranged unit so i know they were good in melee before so basically you're getting the same ranged unit for 25 gold cheaper but they're going to be less useful engaging other units pistoliers plus 10 range increased accuracy oh that's fine i thought that was the the mounted ones <laughs> pistoliers plus 10 range increased accuracy so pistoliers i believe are the non-armor piercing units and that's actually really good. Plus 10 range, increased accuracy. That'll make them more viable against Beastmen, you know, against Greenskins, against Skaven. Give more. So I, I really like these changes. Although I haven't seen anything to, to um, great swords. So I wonder if you're going to see a nerf to Chaos warriors with great weapons because you know in our testing the great swords were definitely underperforming the chaos warriors with great weapons were doing all we're, we're pound for pound the best in the game and you know we saw all the dwarf infantry how they were underperforming as well so the dwarf great weapon infantry with the exception of the hammers so okay here we go boys and girls time to go over the dwarfs cross your fingers Okay, well, there's some stuff here. So Thorgrim added a new Oath of Vengeance ability, allowing Thorgrim to reduce the melee defense of an enemy unit. Ah, cool. I like it. Ungrim added the new Red Ruin ability, allowing Ungrim to trade melee defense for significantly more weapon strength. Love it. Very thematic. Grom Brindle plus two melee defense. Good. I, I think that's good. Grom Brindle, I mean, there's no bad Dwarf Lords, so this will just make him a little more tanky. Tweef, tweaked, geno ah, tweaked, Dwarf generic character item choices for multiplayer battles. Cool. So hopefully we'll see that Silver Horn of Vengeance will be gone. That plus 36% charge bonus, which has never been picked by anyone in the history of history. All right. Rune Lord Anvil of Power plus 150 cost added Locust of Power ability to be automatic. I think that's good. Like, you know, that's when you put him on his mount and you give him the plus 15 magic resistance to your army. I think that's just a good... Because you do that, you do that anyways, and if you don't do it, you're mad because you forgot to do it. So I think that is a good change, 
and it just makes the game easier and make more sense. So good job. <gasps> Master Engineer! Improved accuracy! Hooray! I guess my that's my high, happy dwarf voice. Hooray! <laughs> This is awesome. We'll see. Increase the range by 35. Great. Increase projectile mass and velocity. Fantastic. Oh my god. We have some testing to do, boys and girls, on that Master Engineer. Like, the first test I'm going to do is I'm going to have a master, master Engineer fight another Master Engineer and see if one can kill the other. Because <laughs> I made a video two years ago where they couldn't even kill another Master Engineer after using all their ammo. So we'll see if we can get that done. Grumbling Guard. Mm, added charge defense versus large. Okay, that's good. That's the same as the other. Minus two charge bonus, plus two melee attack, minus one melee defense, minus 40 mass. So how? what does this mean? Minus two charge bonus, I don't like. That's it. So, but plus two melee attack, I do like. Minus one melee offense, I don't like. <laughs> Okay, let me think. Charge defense against large, that makes sense because all the other long beards with great weapons had that and they didn't. Minus two charge bonus, okay. Dwarfs are short, maybe their charge bonus should be low. Plus two melee attack means they're just doing more damage than sustained, which I like. And minus one melee defense. So they're a little more attack oriented, but that's a net buff. Like plus two melee attack, minus one melee defense is definitely a net buff. This minus 40 mass, we'll see. Like, there's some big buffs to chariots for a few other factions, so that minus 40 mass could be start being painful, and big buffs to a lot of the mass of heroes, so that could be painful. Longbeard's all minus 40 mass, so dwarfs got a big buff to mass, now they're take, clawing some of that back. So the goblobber, minus 2 melee attack, plus 4 melee defense, slightly increased accuracy. Oh, good. Grudge thrower, slightly increased accuracy. All right, I, I like that. I don't know if the Goblobber needed it, but uh, maybe these things go together. Dragonback Slayers. Minus two charge bonus. Minus five melee. Oh, I see. Okay, the Dragonback Slayers. Minus two charge bonus. Minus five melee attack. Plus 12 melee defense. This is good. This is definitely good. I mean, first of all, it's just a straight up buff. Now, they're going to go from 50 melee, 5 0 melee attack to 45, which is still very good. Minus 2 charge bonus, okay, but plus 12 melee defense, they are going to be a lot tankier. Uh, they're going to take a lot less damage against other infantry, against, you know, large. I, I, this is a definite buff for Dragonback Slayers. We'll see what they do to the rest of Slayers. Ekron Miners, minus 2 melee defense, really? Like, Ekron Miners are, I guess they're they're okay if you can get them off. Iron Breakers, minus 20 mass, okay. That makes sense, you know, I guess. It's fair enough. Iron Breakers got a big increase to mass. Now they're clawing a little bit back, but they're minus 20 to the Iron Breakers and minus 40 to the Longbeards, which I'm, I'm happy to see. It'll just make the Iron, the Iron Breakers, again, I like that Iron Breakers, I love the place Iron Breakers are in right now. They're so fantastic. They're a great unit. They are like the wall that could stop an avalanche, and I love it. And that they're rebalancing this a little bit is fine. And they're taking some mass away from the Longbeards, a little bit away from the Ironbreakers, but less than the Longbeards, which I like. The Norgrimlings Ironbreakers, minus four melee attack, plus four melee defense, minus one leadership, which doesn't matter so much, but it's something, minus 20 mass. Oh, man. That, well, so... What this means is that, obviously, I mean, this is all a net nerf, because especially, like, this is a stealth nerf, and I'm going to tell you why it's a stealth nerf, and it's just a straight, you can basically say that plus four melee defense is a plus zero melee defense, and minus four melee attack is just a straight up nerf, so, I mean, they can do this, I'm disappointed in UCA for doing it like this, this, this upsets me. So, right now they have like 82 melee defense. A normal unit has 30 melee attack is decent. 40 melee attack is really good. So you add the base of 35, you have 75 melee attack against 82 melee defense. You're going to hit 8% of the time. So already their melee defense is so good that most units 
are going to be hitting them for the minimum anyways. So this plus four melee defense makes almost no difference unless they're being charged by something with a lot of melee attack or something with a really big charge bonus. So I don't know. I get why they want to, like, Norgrimling's Iron Breakers are extremely good, and I don't know. Like, this is going to be noticeable. For anyone who loves Norgrimling's Iron Breakers, this is going to be very noticeable. This minus four melee attack, you're going to notice that unit's going to get significantly weaker. That 4% damage reduction is, is going to be noticeable. Skolder Guard, minus three melee defense. Were Skolder Guard that good? Peak gate guard minus four charge bonus minus two melee defense minus 50 cost Yeah, it's a it's a net nerf for sure Minus 50 cost though is okay. They will go from 1500 to 1450 so Minus two melee defense they are gonna be squishier and that minus four charge bonus are just gonna have a little less impact damage so Uthar's Raiders, minus three melee attack, plus three melee defense, oh, plus six leadership, thank goodness. Those Uthar's Raiders were actually quite easy to route. This is just going to make them a better, this is a definitely a big buff for this unit. Uthar's Raiders are a, a very, very good unit if you can keep them safe. And that plus three melee defense will help them against charges, but the plus six leadership is a pretty big deal for them. Uh, so very nice change for the Uthar's Raiders. I'm actually, that's, oh, that's excellent actually. The Warriors of Dragonfire Pass, minus three melee attack, plus three melee defense. What do I think of that? So they're just basically making the dwarves a little tankier and do a little less damage. But they haven't, I see no changes to their units that have great weapons, which is disappointing. Because we know miners... Dwarf Warriors with Great Weapons and Longbeards with Great Weapons are all underperforming pretty pretty badly. So, I mean, okay. They're just going to make your Warriors of Dragonfire Pass do a lot less damage. 3% less damage is a lot. It, it's a lot. No, it's a net. It's really a, a, a wash. It's just changing the nature of how the Warriors of Dragonfire Pass operate. Skyhammer, minus one melee defense, increased clatter gun accuracy. I guess that's probably making the Skyhammer more in line with the other gyrocopters, but increased chatter gun, clatter gun accuracy is good. Gyro bomber increased clatter gun accuracy is good. Bugman's Rangers minus 20 mass. Okay. This might be more of a nerf than it looks like because the Bugman's Rangers could take charges extremely well. Uh, so they're going to get knocked around a little more. They still have the charge defense against large and they're still completely awesome. And I'm glad they didn't get any other kind of nerf in this. So that's, so they're going to continue to be an awesome unit for the dwarfs. Now, all in all, all excellent changes and one amazing change. This master engineer, maybe for the master engineer can finally be a competitive pick with that improved accuracy. Increased range by 35 is a pretty big deal. Increased the projectile mass and velocity. So what this does is, so basically I'm, it's saying improved accuracy and improved accuracy. So that increased velocity will just make it get to the target faster so you know this is basically a double buff to accuracy and their projectile mass increasing it means they're going to knock more things over when they hit them or stagger things which is actually really fantastic and that increased range very good so we'll see how this plays out with the master engineer i hope this improved accuracy is a big improvement to accuracy and not just a a small one but we're going to do that testing I'm very happy about that all the other changes seem reasonable for the most part uh this norgrimling iron breakers i mean that is just a straight up stealth nerf plus four melee defense it looks like they're 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 doing a trade but this is not a trade when something has 82 melee defense going from 82 to 86 is not going to make a difference in 99 percent of the time they're spent fighting anything so that's a little upsetting. I would have rather seen something different or just a straight up minus four melee attack reduction. Well, you know, just so it's more clear because a lot of people might look at that and think, oh, that's pretty fair, pretty reasonable. This is just a straight up nerf to Norgamling's Iron Breakers. 
No, did they need a nerf? Uh, probably. They're they're very very good, so it's probably fair. I, I am disappointed to see no change to the miners, no change to to um, dwarf warriors with great weapons, and no changes to longbeards with great weapons. So we're gonna go through another six months with you know in multiplayer where those three units are generally a poor choice unless you have a very specific reason to use them. So, all right. Let's go on to Bretonia. So Bretonia, not very much, but all non-flying knights plus 50 mount mass. Okay, Alberic, Spirit of the Tempest is now an uncommon ability, costing 162. Prophetess, all, change Scepter of Stability item to a new scroll of Assault of Stone item. So maybe that's a one-time use from something that's always with them to a one-time use, it looks like. Pegasus Knights and Royal Pegasus Knights reduced unit spacing distance, allowing more men to contact with their charge. I think that's going to be very welcome for Bretonian players because these Pegasus Knights and Royal Pegasus Knights were had really f weird looking charges and they weren't doing a whole lot of damage on the charge. So uh, I think that'll be very welcome. So we're probably going to see Pegasus Knights and Royal Pegasus Knights as the Dowie against Bretonia if you do come across that matchup. Questing Knights plus 5 charge bonus minus 100 cost. Ooh, that's a big that is a big buff. Now I think the questing knights were not the ones you saw very often, but the, you did see them, so you're going to see them more. Battle pilgrims plus one health per entity, I think needed and good. Foot squires plus one health per entity, that's a nice buff. And needed foot squires were definitely underperforming. The grail well, relic, the grail relic, uh, minus 866 health, minus 100. Ooh, boy. So minus 100 cost, minus 800 health. So basically the Grail Relic buffs leadership and does some other things, I don't know what. So it is, but it is in common in some builds to really help the leadership of the low leadership abilities of Bretonia. This minus 866 health is a pretty big deal. If you focus that thing down, you'll focus it down quickly, especially if you have any kind of ranged. And minus 100 cost though takes some of that pain away. Uh, okay, Knights of the Realm minus 50 cost. Wow, Paladin, Barded Warhorse plus 5 armor. Okay, the Green Knight plus 600 mass. I think that's good. Green Knight should be able to get around. And a lot of people, when they're playing against the Green Knight, know just to leave it alone. Kill everything else and then save the Green Knight for last. The Blessed Field Trebuchet plus 16 explosion AP damage minus 10 explosion base damage plus 1 explosion radius, slightly improved accuracy. And the field trebuchet slightly improved accuracy. Okay, these are reasonable. Bretonian, Bretonian artillery is not very good. Not that it has to be good, but they only have really one choice in the trebuchet and the blessed trebuchet. So I think that seems reasonable. It looks like they're wanting to... There's going to be a lot more artillery. A lot more artillery in this cycle by the looks of it. Bretonian artillery is a little bit better. Skaven artillery is better. They had no changes to dwarf artillery, but besides from, I think, uh, well, a little, yeah, it's like even the the grudge thrower is more accurate, and so was the goblobber. So every bit of, looks like artillery has got a net buff in this cycle, so we're going to see some more, particularly out of Empire. Dwarf artillery is in very, is a very nice spot. Now, hopefully, artillery starts targeting the center mass of thing instead of the damn edges. If it still attacks the edges, I'm going to be very disappointed, but, you know. Uh, yeah, so those are the changes for Bretonia. I like them. Bretonia making their their questing knights cheaper, and another knights of the realm cheaper. Love it. Just you know, and I guess they're saying that the rest of Bretonia. Yeah, this is actually good changes. We'll see how Bretonia performs. Like battle programs plus one health per en per model entity and foot squires is is not nothing, but I still think foot squires are pretty weak for their cost. Battle pilgrims though, we'll see that the, this will straight up help Bretonia. Like the, this is just a straight up buff, so it's not real big though. But we'll see how it plays out. So abilities improvements. Okay, so that is all of the multiplayer changes. So just before we go on to ability improvements, really, I think the story here. is vampire accounts um tomb kings have been really rebalanced away they've been rebalanced away from their constructs and towards their base army vampire accounts have had some significant changes and hopefully these hex rates karen race and where are the the other ones 
uh, have changed the mortise hinges. So Vampire counts are changing pretty significantly. Um, green skins with the wall has changed. Beastmen, eh, but Empire. Empire has really seen a big change. I don't, I don't think Empire players are going to be happy that the uh, flagellants didn't have a, didn't, you know, the, the flagellants didn't get a, a look, and nor did great swords. So I think some Empire players are are still going to be upset about that. But there's a lot to work with here. It's just going to change the nature of how Empire is played. Hopefully, we see the steam tank, the Luminarch of Hish, the and more. The Empire has great artillery, and hopefully we see more of that. Pistoliers are much better. You know, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I would guess that those two units is specific. The Great Swords and the flag uh, the Flagellants are going to be units that m most Empire players will have wanted to see changed and have not been changed. But Empire has definitely seen a lot of love. The Dowie... I mean, this Master Engineer, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I'm not happy that... We didn't see some great weapon improvements, but just seeing this Master Engineer after two full years of the Master Engineering being so poor and me wanting, I, I, I'm an engineer. <laughs> I spent 30 years as an engineer, and I, you know, and, and seeing the Master Engineer, I want to use the Master Engineer so bad, and that range is a big deal in the mass and velocity. So I will see. I hope the Master Engineer is now fantastic. So generally really good changes for the Dowie. And so let's go into the ability improvements. So the story, I think, is Empire, for sure. So we'll go to ability improvements. Lore of Beast, Curse of Van Rare, increased duration for 33 to 39 seconds. The Amber Spear, minus 55 armor piercing missile damage, plus 150 base missile damage. Hmm. That is a big buff, I think. It's going to be a big buff. Because you're going to use that, they're going to be able to use that Amber Spear against um, low armored units like casters and stuff. I mean, it's going to, it's a nerf against the Dowie, but you don't see the Amber Spear against the Dowie. Amber Spear upgraded, minus 110 missile, plus 300 base missile damage. The Lore of Big Wah, Gaze of Mork, and upgraded, plus 40 armor piercing missile damage, minus 40 base missile damage. So we're definitely going to see the Gaze of Mork played with. That's quite a big buff. Especially against the Dowie, we might we might see that as the Dowie, the Gaze of Mork, Lore of High mar Magic, Fiery Convocation removed the random direction change angle. Yeesh. So Fiery Convocation is going to is going to become a lot better right now because it's going to go straight. Uh, Hand of Glory increased duration from 22 to 29 seconds. I don't know what that is. Soul Quench plus 20. Plus 200 armor piercing missile damage, plus minus 200 base missile damage. Now, I don't know what Soul Quench is, but I guarantee you if we see High Elves that you're going to see that spell. Soul Quench upgraded, plus 348 armor piercing missile damage, minus 348 base missile damage. Wow. Laura Fire, the Fireball, plus 208 armor piercing missile damage, minus 200 base missile damage. Really? Oh my god, you're going to see Fireballs all over the damn place. Wow, that's a big buff. I mean, that's a huge buff. That's not. That's not because fireballs were not that awful, but that's that is a massive buff. And like vampires have fire, chaos has fire, empire has fire. Who else has fire? I can't. I don't know. But you're gonna see fireballs. Lore of vampires. Vanel's Dance Macabre and upgraded duration increased from 25 seconds to 29 seconds. Okay, Curse of Years duration increased from 28 seconds to 32 seconds. Okay, Gaze of Nagash minus 23 armor piercing projectile damage plus 33 base projectile damage. Okay, remember Gaze of Nagash was unbelievable. So that's got that's a net nerf for for the Dowie a net buff against low armor targets. Lore of Light. Barona's Time Warp and Upgraded. The duration increased from 41 seconds to 50 seconds. I like this type of little rebalances here. Shem's Burning Gaze, minus 16 armor piercing, plus 22 projectile damage. So it's a net nerf against the Dowie, a net buff against a lot of factions. Shem's Burning Gaze, same thing. Minus 32 AP, plus 44 projectile damage. Light of Battle, minus 1 power cost. I don't know what that is. Lore of Little Wah. Vindictive Glare, plus 40 armor piercing, minus 40 base missile damage. Again, 
We're going to see more of that, possibly. Night Shroud, minus one power cost. Night Shroud, upgraded, min upgraded minus two power cost. So I think that's that puts a unit basically into stealth mode. So that might be used. Lore of Death, the Fate of Buna. Here we go. Change the entity hit chance from 0.25 to 0.18. Now needs 50 entities to max out on damage. Plus two power cost. Hmm. Well, I like the power cost. See, I, I, Fate of Buna is is a very reliable spell because it's not like a vortex where you where you see it just gets cast on the ground it goes all around it is basically a a, a a simple spell you click on something and you hit it and it's just like rune of wrath and ruin um which is very reliable so but it's also extremely powerful so this to me is saying it changed the into so maybe it needs to hit 50 entities. So if you have a unit with 75 entities, it will hit. Ah, okay. Needs 50 entities to max out on damage. So the entity hit chance. So if you have, let's say you had 100 entities, this is, is this saying that it would hit 25% of them? And now it only hit 18% of them? I mean, that's a very big nerf if that's how if i'm reading that right and it now needs 50 entities to max out on damage so perhaps it has to hit 50 entities but if it's only hitting like what what i'm saying is if, if it hit 25 percent before it needed to have 200 entities to max out on damage is that how that works i don't know it'll be interesting to see basically this we're gonna have to just test fate of buna and see how hard it hits now um you know it's not a giant issue as the dowi because you know you have magic resistance but this is a very big nerf and this is something i think a lot of people wanted to see a nerf because it's costs it costs more it does less i mean those kind of nerfs are always bigger than you think because it's not just that it's doing less it's costing more and doing less and this whole 50 entities to max out on damage i don't i'm assuming that's a nerf Maybe it needed 20 entities to max out on damage. Maybe, you know, now it needs 50. I don't know exactly what that means. But to me, when I read this, it sounds like nerf, nerf, you know, nerf. It's got three nerfs. So I'm sure it'll be still useful because it's so easy to get it off. But uh, maybe it will bring other lords of magic more into play when you have lore of death in your kit so lore of ruin skitter leap minus one power cost skitter leap upgraded minus two power cost the dreaded 13 spell minus one power cost okay um other abilities guardian change from 22 percent physical resistance to 18 percent physical resistance okay forbidden rod reduced average damage to self by 30 percent okay so when you activate that it doesn't hurt hurt as much Blood Statuette of Spite, reduced damage chance from 20% to 18%, okay. Nefara Scroll of Mighty Incantation, added five, max five targets. Maybe it could hit 20 targets, I don't know. Bloodlust can now target yourself. Okay, so those are all the ability improvements. And that's just about it. So modding, modders can now use both specific campaign folders and the general campaign folders to load mod scripts together without crashing. That sounds good to me. Uh, modders can now use UI scripting within multiplayer with careful use of the new UI trigger script event. Script event. <laughs> I think this the, uh, these sound like good things. I'm glad they're supporting the modding community. Um, this is one of the wonderful things about this game, and I think about modding in general, is if you were to look at this from a business standpoint, you know, people in a corporate office might think, why would I let people mod my game because that may take away future revenue from down dlc that i want to make but it just never seems to work that way like we've got chaos mods out there right now i played against shadow and it was a really fun and when chaos factions come out 
they're going to be just as popular. You know, there's mods, there was mods right away to move, you know, unlocker mods to move, you know, heroes from one faction to another and people still played it. And then when you could download it, people still bought it. You know, there's a mod right now for Kislev, with, which has all kinds of units in. When Kislev comes out, people are still going to love it. Modding only serves as a net increase to exposure and popularity. And when the game comes out with something that has been modded, it's almost always successful. And I think modding can, the modding community and the strength of mods are a are a pretty good indicator of what people want and so it's almost like free market research like it's like the the modding community in total war has always been fantastic and it has really always added to the game and i like that they're giving modder modders good tools and you know this this is a game that it could have gone the other way like you know games workshop could have said no modding right and even though there's like, a, you know, war, there's been a war call of Warhammer mod for Total War for some time, but they could have said no modding, but whatever. I think they've done a great job with modding. In my opinion, there's some great mods out there and they're just going to, they're just making, making it easier for modders to be more effective with less crouches are just a good thing all around. So known issues, Hellebrons, the Cursed Blade ability currently continues to apply damage even when its effects should be blocked by phase recharge. Maybe that's why Hellebron has been... So I've been watching some of the early access stuff and hellebron has been freaking crushing. So maybe that's part of why Hellebron has been so unbelievable. So anyways, that is that is it. That is everything. So this, you know, doesn't have everything I want, but it has some key things that I really like, which are... You know, like like I said, auto resolve improvements, things that they could have just let and said, okay, we're fine with it. But they're improving smaller parts of the game, and they're continuing to make big improvements. I just love. I mean, I, I the two big things, you know, Unger, Meyer, Fist, and Karak Kadrin for the Dowie and the Master Engineer are awesome and fantastic. I'm really, really happy to see that. I'm excited about this. I can't wait to play the campaign, and I hope you guys are all excited about it too. That's it for my review. And, uh, you know, I had nothing else to say, talked a lot already, so that's it for me, so I will see you soon.